So thank you for tuning in and welcome to the first Facebook Live for the Oxford Sparks Brain Discovery Week. Today, we have come to the Oxford Centre for Human Brain Activity to interview Dr. Michael Browning. Uh, please ask your questions below. Uh, we'll be asking Michael live. Um, if you just put them in the comments box, we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. So first of all, Michael, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, can you let us know a bit about your research and what you do? Yep. I'm uh, a psychiatrist, and so I treat people that have mental illnesses like depression and anxiety. So my research is focused on trying to understand why people develop depression and anxiety. And the reason I want to understand that is that I'd like to uh, try and develop more useful and more effective treatments for them. And because if we understand what causes these problems, uh, then we can develop new treatments that might be more helpful uh, for treating them. And the specific uh, work that I do looks at the habits and the way that people think um, that might lead to depression and anxiety. So for example, um, when people are depressed, they will tend to focus on very negative things much more so than when they're not depressed. So for example, if you were asked to go to a party and you're depressed, you might think, oh, the party will be awful, I don't want to go, I wouldn't have a good time. Whereas if you're not depressed, you might think, oh, that sounds like fun and, and you might go. So I'm looking to try and find why people have these negative thoughts because we know that these negative thoughts um, can cause depression. Now, it's quite difficult to work out what the brain does because the brain is quite complex um, uh, organ and people are very complex and sophisticated in the way they make these decisions. So what I do is I get people to do quite a simple task um, which elicits this negative bias in the way they think. And then what I do is I develop and uh, write simple computer programs that also do the same task and I tweak around with those programs until the, the programs make the same decision as a patient. And then a good thing about a computer program is you can look inside it where you can't look inside a, a patient. So I look inside and see how the computer programs are coming to these decisions and I think the same thing's probably happening in a patient's brain. And then I work out how I might be able to change um, the decisions or, or the way that the person thinks, assuming that they're thinking in the same way as this computer program. So how do you treat, uh, like, how, how do treatments for anxiety and depression work though? And I think we're going to actually do a bit of a live demonstration, aren't we? So we're going to ask someone to kind of come in and, and demonstrate it really. Yeah. So there are lots of different sorts of treatments for anxiety and depression. There's things like self-help book, self books, talking treatments, there's drug treatments like antidepressants, and there's neurostimulatory treatments. And one of the interesting things about all of them is these all alter the way your brain works. So just reading about something changes the way you think about yourself or your world, and, and, and obviously thinking the, way, the organ that does your thinking is your brain, so that changes how your brain works. Antidepressants change... Um, the neurotransmitters which link up neurons in the brain, that's how they work, um, and the neurostimulatory methods directly use electricity or magnetism to stimulate parts of the brain. So we're going to show uh, an example of one of the neurostimulatory methods now. This is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And what's going to happen with this is um, Jacinta here is going to uh, use uh, a TMS coil to stimulate a part of my brain that controls movements in this case, and it's going to make, um, hopefully, my, my hand move without me trying to move it myself. Okay, that's great. And I know we've got the machine behind us. So could you kind of talk us through uh, what you're doing and, and how this would kind of work? So if um, you were our patient then, Michael, so what was the first step that we'd be doing? So um, what Jacinta has done before is measure my head uh, because she knows where in my brain is the strip of the brain that controls my movement. So she's worked out roughly where that is uh, on my head and she's gonna put the uh, coil above that and stimulate it to make sure she's in the, the right area. So if we do that now. Okay, so she's just measured it. So she knows where she's going to be. So this contraption is the, it's called coil, is it? The, the part that she's gonna put over your head now? Yeah. And okay. It, it, this is what produces the, the change in the magnetic field. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Are you relaxed? Yeah. Okay, so if we're in the right place, then there should be a twitch from your hand. So here we go. How did that feel? That felt fine. Is Shall it again? we try again? Yeah. Okay, so you can watch the hand. Here we go. Do you want to describe how that feels? So it feels, it's, it's a funny, it's like a twitch that you sometimes get. I didn't do it, I didn't do it myself. It wasn't sore or painful, uh, but it just suddenly happened by itself. 
And so the interesting thing about this, I mm. think, is that there's a strip of my brain just here which controls the movements in my body. And um, what Jacinta did was use the coil there to stimulate the brain right underneath the coil, and that sent a signal right down to my hand and made it move just uh, on its own. Now, when we treat depression and anxiety, we don't stimulate this part of the brain that controls movements because we're not worried about that. We it, put it a bit further forward into the, the frontal areas of the brain, which are more involved in controlling um, how we regulate our own emotions and our, and our feelings. And so it doesn't make your hand move or any part of your body move, but if you do it repeatedly, uh, not just once or twice, um, then there's uh, some evidence that that can help with depression. And mental health is, is seeming to get more publicity recently and, and awareness. And, you know, obviously you're working in that field. I mean, how important do you think this is? So I think that's really important. Um, for a long time, people have been uh, quite reluctant to speak about their difficulties with mental health. And I think a lot of people are, are understandably worried about what other people will think or what, how other people will treat them. But the unfortunate consequence of this is that people tend to try and bottle things up and not really tell anyone uh, what's going on. And it can make it much more difficult to, to deal with things. So often the first thing to do if you're having any difficulties uh, with anxiety, depression, or any of that sort of stuff is to tell someone that you trust what's going on. And so that might be a, a member of your family, a friend, a teacher, r really anyone. And sometimes um, you'll find that even just telling people how you're feeling helps a, a great deal and you wouldn't need to do anything else. But if you do need to do anything else uh, to help, then the first uh, step of that is talking to other people and discussing it uh, and, and getting that help. Because mental health, is, uh, uh, you touched on it earlier, you, you said that we're quite complex beings and we're all very different. Um, but I was going to ask you, you know, why do people react differently in the same environment? So that's a really interesting question in this whole field. And uh, I'm sure that people will recognise the fact that you can have two people that perhaps have the same thing happen to them, maybe something quite nasty. And for uh, some people, that will really make them feel awful and, and low. And other people, it'll be like water off a duck's back and, and they won't mind. In fact, even for yourself, there might be some times when a bad thing happens and you just brush it off. Whereas other times, it, it can really cut quite deeply and, ma and make you feel um, quite rotten. And so understanding why we get that difference is... is those differences between people or even within a person is one of the big challenges in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And we know there's a few things that can influence it. So the most obvious thing that influences it is just the previous experience that, that you've had. So if you've just been having a rotten time generally and a lot of things have been going wrong and then something else goes wrong, it's not surprising that maybe that would affect you more than if everything's been going super duper. Um, but even setting that aside, people seem to differ a little bit in their temperament and how reactive they are to, to bad things happening. And um, one of the things that can influence that uh, is the genetics of the person. So some people just are a bit more prone to have a reaction to, to the things that they experience th than other people as well. So really, uh, the question is why do people behave differently is, is an extremely complex question. And it's for a whole range of reasons, including things that we're born with and, and are inherent in us and things that um, are part of the environment in which we've lived. Because I was going to ask, actually, is anxiety and depression inherited, is it? Uh, yeah, so it is inherited a, a bit, okay? So that when I say a bit, what I mean is it's not very, very strongly inherited, so it's not like some of the genetic disorders that if you have a particular gene, then you'll always get anxiety and depression, and if you don't have that gene, then you won't. What seems to happen with anxiety and depression is there are lots and lots and lots of genes that increase your risk of having it just a tiny amount or decrease your risk of having it a tiny amount. And everyone will have some of those genes, but, it, but uh, on, uh, when you add up their effect, they can increase your risk of um, developing the illness or decrease your risk of, of developing the illness. And that kind of reflects really the sorts of... Um, uh, or how complex psychiatric problems are. So it's not like they're like a broken bone, which has got a single cause. Which, is, So if you think you've got a broken bone, you can do an x-ray, and if there's a crack there, then you've got the broken bone, and if there's not a crack there, then you don't. There's nothing as clear-cut as that with the psychiatric illnesses generally, or with depression and anxiety. What there is is the whole range of causes, including genetic, including environmental, all of which can uh, make you more likely to develop the illness or less likely. 
But do you have any advice for those who might suffer with anxiety or depression? Yeah. So my first bit of advice was is to speak to somebody. As, as I said before, it's very difficult to deal with these things um, on your own. And the first instance, like I said, is, is talking to someone you can trust. That might be enough t to help you. But if it isn't, then there are other uh, ways that w in which you can get support. And you want to do that with your, the person you trust. Um, and that might include uh, a counsellor or a therapist or a teacher or a doctor, depending um, on how severe you find your symptoms. And obviously, I think we were talking about this off camera, but we were saying actually the brain is still one of those uh, parts of the body that we still know so little about. Um, I mean, how did you kind of get into your field of research with it? Yeah, so I, um, like I said, trained as a doctor and I treat people with anxiety and depression. And it's really striking how sophisticated people are in, in learning about and adapting to the, to the world they find themselves in. And so it became relatively clear to me that if we were going to develop treatments for depression and anxiety that work and that help people to adapt uh, more effectively to, to their world, we have to understand how that happens, how the brain learns from experience and adapts to experience. And so um, after I did my medical training when I was working as a doctor, I started doing a PhD uh, research in Oxford, um, looking at these sorts of questions about how people learn from their environment, and I learned how to do difficult things like these computational models I was describing you about. Um, and from that, I've kind of incorporated that with my clinical practice, which is treating people with depression, to try and, and work out how best to develop new treatments. And uh, since you've been doing your kind of field of research, because it is kind of cutting edge and everything, you know, has there been the most interesting thing you've discovered about the brain since you've been doing this kind of line yeah. of research? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that are, are really interesting for people that are thinking about going into this area of research. I think, I guess the thing that was most striking for me was how efficient the brain is at, at performing really complex calculations. Mm -hmm. So I, I mentioned that what I do as part of my research is I build these computer programs to emulate what a person does. And um, one of the things I do is that people tune what they learn to. They learn more from things that they think are more informative and less from things that they think are, are less informative. And that sounds really easy to say, but I build computer programs that do the same thing, and they take about 24 hours to make one decision. And these are quite powerful computers running constantly to do that. So it's a really difficult thing to calculate. And people can make that same decision relatively instantaneously. So they probably do it in a rough and ready way, but it's incredible how efficient people are at making these really difficult decisions about what's going on in their environment and what sort of information they should pay attention to. And so it's probably because um, while we evolved, we have to make those sorts of decisions about things that might be threatening us, for example, in the environment, and we can't afford to sit down and think for a day about each particular decision we make. Um, but the outcome of that really is that you have this incredibly efficient and sophisticated system for making really complex decisions that y you or I, when we make those decisions, are really have no idea about the, the complexity that's going on there. We're not aware of how complex decisions are. We just do it automatically. And I was going to ask you as well, I mean, um, have you seen a big difference between age groups? Do you find that, um, you know, children obviously respond completely different to adults, but is that something that you're, you're looking at in your research? So I don't look at that sort of mm. developmental question mm. myself, but there are a number of people that, that have looked at it, and, and you can see the sort of complexity um, increasing uh, uh, throughout development. Um, having said that, even babies are quite sophisticated in the ways that they, that they respond to, to things in their environment. So it is, um, we, we get more sophisticated and we get more um, elaborate in the way that we make decisions, but there's also a lot of really complex decisions that are made really just at, at a very low level in, in our brains and our nervous system um, that is are there from, from very early on. And obviously we're interviewing Michael because it is Brain Awareness Week and we're trying to show the, the incredible research that we do here at the University of Oxford. Is there anywhere else that you would recommend for people to find out more about um, you know, mental health or depression or anxiety? Um, because I think it is a subject that people are really kind of keen to learn about. Yeah, so the NHS website has um, questions or answers about uh, illnesses and about treatment uh, that you can get. 
Um, there's also, I think, uh, quite a lot of uh, good leaflets that are generally uh, distributed to schools that have the sort of basic information. And, and so I think from the point of view of um, those sorts of uh, uh, questions about illnesses, mm -hmm. then that would be a place to go. And then the, the, if those are not enough, it's worthwhile speaking to your, your GP. And we've um, had a question come in um, from someone who's watching it live and just wants to know if this magnetic signal or the, the machine that you were using in the background can help anxiety disorders like OCD as well. There's some evidence that it can help OCD. Yeah, so there's um, uh, this is a, what's called a neurostimulatory treatment and there's quite a mm. few different neurostimulatory treatments. Um, and they're, they haven't been used for very long, so the evidence to support them is not enormously strong. Um, so most of the studies for this sort of TMS coil out that you've seen have been in um, depression, but there have been some in anxiety, and I think there have been some in o OCD, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Great. Well, Michael, thank you for joining us today. Um, if you are just tuning in, um, please watch the full video and ask your comments below, because Michael will be on hand over the next few weeks to kind of answer those questions. Um, and this is our first Facebook Live uh, for the Oxford Sparks Brain Discovery Week. Uh, we'll be doing one every day uh, this week, leading up to a Friday where we'll be doing our actual live experiment. Um, but thank you, Michael, for joining us, and uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you.